Peace, family. This is Darnell Gabriel from Revolutionary Sword. All right, I'm live again, and um, I'm just jumping on real quick just to kind of give out some more information pertaining to Adam being the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. So um, I'm going to try to make this hopefully short and sweet. Uh, to give you a clear-cut understanding, but the the title of this video is going to be Strong's Exhaustance Concordance and Brown Driver Briggs points to uh, Serpent is the man, okay? Serpent is man, and uh, I'm just going to go into the concordances and kind of show you how I got the breakdown that adam is the serpent in genesis chapter three based off of using a concordance and uh after i do that i'm going to give you a few references of scripture uh where the word serpent is used and it's always the majority of the time pointing to a man now if you remember uh the last recording I did that was live, uh, the, the dictionaries that I pointed to, uh, Eastern Dictionary, uh, International Standard Bible Dictionary, it always said most of the time the word serpent is used metaphorically. Okay? The word serpent. Okay? Okay? Okay, so share my screen right quick. And I'm going to go back into Genesis chapter 3. Okay, here we go. Now, um, I'm going to enlarge my screen a little bit. Hopefully you all can see it. And we read it last week, or not last week, but early part of the week, but we're going to read it again. And it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, now, of course, you can clearly see that I'm in the blue letter Bible and you see that it got the Strong's uh, numbers, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the Strong's numbers. Now, in my conversation, in my video where me and the gentleman was going back and forth on Berean TV, uh, I was explaining to him that when I'm introducing this concept uh, to somebody about Adam being the serpent, there's a breakdown that I go through uh, within the text itself, but also uh, outside of the text when it comes to like the first chapter of Genesis or the second chapter. But most definitely when you're doing a breakdown, you have to go into the definition parts. And I want to make it known to everybody. Now, I don't speak Hebrew, nor do I speak Greek. I just read. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I just read and I try to go as deep as I can. And, you know, God willing, one day I will be able to take up one of those languages and be able to, you know, uh, expound according to the way it's read in Hebrew. But right now, uh, I'm big on using uh, concordances and dictionaries and commentaries right and this is how i'm able to expand on the information that the bible is trying to bring out okay so now i'm going to uh go into the actual dictionary part and give me one second and i'm going to pull it up and you can see that it's 
transition over to the lexicon, which is the um, the actual Strong's Concordance. Okay, so I'm a I'm gonna enlarge my screen again. Hopefully, you all can see that. But you see the Hebrew word nakash, right? And it literally does say serpent and snake, right? So we're clear about that. But then you also see mythological, okay? Like we did in the last video, it actually, we actually said that, you know, mythological is not necessarily something real. I want you to look down here in this part where it says uh, uh, Genesis lexicon help, right? It says a serpent so-called from its hissing, see the root, where well, the root would be up here, right? The ethnology part. And it says Genesis 3, 1, Exodus 4, 3, 7, 15, 2 Kings 18 and 4. Now, this is very interesting because I don't think most people pay attention uh, when they're reading some of these uh, concordances when, it, when it's trying to bring out information. This would actually be connected with the mythological part, right? The fleeing serpent. And it says used of the constellation of the serpent or dragon in the northern part of the sky. Now, if I got a little time, I'll, I'll pull that up because there is a constellation where they it's actually called the dragon. And I seen it myself. And some of you all that might be uh, into all that constellation stuff might be aware of it. Okay, so, but what I want to do is I'm going to use the concordance and go to the etymology part, the root. And I'm going to uh, show you how in the etymology, just like the uh, Eastern Dictionary, International Standard Encyclopedia, uh, and the other dictionaries that I showed you in the last video, how it said that most of the time, the word serpent or the Hebrew word nakash is actually used metaphorically. Actually used metaphorically most of the time. So let me... Uh, Bring this down some, and I'm going to go into the root. Let me change this up. Give me one second. All right. So we got the root of Nakash. Let me enlarge my screen again. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this is big enough for everybody to see. Okay. So we got the word Nakash. But this time, this is the primitive root, right? Primitive root. Notice that in the primitive root part, it says to practice divination. See that word? Divination. To practice divination. Divine. Observe signs. Learn by experience. Diligently observe. Practice fortune telling. Take as an omen. Right. To practice divination. To observe the signs or omens. Now, most of the time. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, people don't pick up that Genesis chapter three, verse one is actually. Adam the man because in their mind they're thinking about Satan the devil that got kicked out of heaven but then when you go to other parts of the Bible where it talks about uh, practicing divination right or observing signs and omens uh, it's always a human being that's doing it always and People will actually say, yeah, yeah, uh, men, women, yeah, we we actually uh, practice some form of divination. 
or we practice some form of observing signs or omens, right? Look at this. Nakash, primitive root, properly to hiss. Whisper a magic spell. Whisper a magic spell. Generally to pronosticate. What is pronosticate? Pronosticate is uh, actually forecasting. You know, like forecasting weather. That's pronosticate. Okay, so it goes on to say certainly divine, certainly divine enchanter, right? Enchantment learned by experience or indeed diligently observed. Now, it will take some time for me to go into each and every part of this definition, which I'm not going to do <laughs> because I actually, I actually sat still long enough to even look through all these uh, different words to see how it's used in different contexts throughout the Bible, right? But I would admonish you to do that. Go through these words and see how it's being used in different contexts of the Bible. And you'll come to find out that every time it's used, it's always pointing to man. And when I say man, I mean male or female okay you're you're never going to see it pointing to a supernatural being that got kicked out of heaven by god you're not going to see that okay now i'm going to exit this full screen and i'm going to take you to uh bible hub okay I'm going to go to Bible Hub. Let me see. Hold on one second. Okay. And I'm going to take you to Bible Hub so I can share my screen with that. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Hopefully you can hear me right now. Let me enlarge. Enlarge this. Okay. Testing one, two, three, testing. Okay. Now I'm in Brown Driver Briggs, right? In Bible Hub. Brown Driver Briggs. Okay. And we can clearly see that Brown Driver Briggs is giving you information about the Hebrew word Nakash, which is serpent. Just to, just to make sure that you understand that when you look in these concordances, right, they're going to use that word and show you how it's being used in different verses and texts throughout the Bible. Can you see that? Genesis 3 and 4, Genesis 3, 13, Genesis 49, 17, Exodus 4 and 3, right? Okay. Now. What I want to do is uh, I need to, excuse me one second, going back and forth. And I'm got to learn how to make the, the reading part bigger without, you know, making the screen larger. So please forgive me if I'm going back and forth like that. But, okay. Just, this is just so you, so you can see that I'm in Bible Hub. Okay. And. I'm looking in Brown Driver 
brig. Okay? Brown driver brig. Now, here in Bible Hub and Brown Driver Briggs, I think I was getting ready to say something uh, a little bit earlier before I started getting into it. But when I was on um, Berean TV going back and forth with a, a gentleman, uh, his icon said spookism. And basically he asked me, did I use more than one concordance other than Strong's. Now he didn't know that I, I've been in Brown driver Briggs before. He didn't know that. And also there are other sources that I use to get more of a clear explanation when I'm trying to understand a subject matter, right? Okay, so let's just go through Brown Driver's Brig right quick. And I'm pulling something up on my phone because I need to do a quick a quick reading why I'm going down this this list. Okay. Now, and so so you can follow along with me. Now, you see the word serpent. Okay? And we can see that the word serpent is being used in Amos chapter 5 verse 19, right? Amos chapter 5 verse 19. And also in Ecclesiastes 10 and 8. Ecclesiastes 10 and 11. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Jeremiah 8 and 17. Notice that it says figurative of enemies. Figurative of enemies. Okay. So also. Numbers 21 and 6. Numbers 21 and 9, collective. Numbers 21 and 7. Okay. Now, what I want to do is let's take a look over here where Brown Driver Briggs is pointing out some of this, this information in these scripture verses. Notice it what it says, and let's look at. I don't want to use Genesis 3 because that's the topic that I'm, you know, or the context that I'm coming out of. But what I want to do is show you that the same Hebrew word nakash or serpent, look how it's used in Genesis 49 and 17. Now, we actually read this in the last video where. It talks about Dan shall be a serpent in the way. Well, we know Dan is a child of Jacob whose name got changed to Israel. And we know that Dan had descendants. But notice that it says Dan shall be a serpent in the way. And you can, you can look at the different translation. Uh, become Dan serpent in the way. Dan shall be a serpent in the way. Okay. So we know that Dan <laughs> is an offspring of Jacob, who is Israel. Okay. And it's using the Hebrew word Nakash. All right. So that's pretty clear cut. Now let's look at what's going on in Exodus 4 and 3. It says, and, and it became a serpent and Moses. Well, we know that this is talking about when Moses, you know, approached Pharaoh and, you know, Moses put his rod down and it turned into a serpent, right? So we know that that was a miracle, but in that context, it was a literal serpent. Okay. So. We know that the dictionaries and the encyclopedia says that the word serpent or nakash most of the time is used metaphorically. This time it wasn't. Now, let me go down a little bit further. Let's look at Numbers 21 and 6. 
this is interesting right here. And it says, fiery serpents among the people. The Lord, the people, serpent, fiery bit. Well, what's going on in that particular uh, verse? Well, it's talking about when the children of Israel started to complain based off of, you know, the mixed multitude who came up out of Egypt with them. Uh, they started complaining about we ain't got nothing to eat. We thirsty, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, God got angry with them. And what he did was send fiery serpents to bite them. Now, most people, based off of, you know, how they want to interpret that, some, some believe that these are uh, what you call divine uh, angelic beings that actually, you know, I don't know, set them on fire. <laughs> or there's another way of interpreting that. God actually sent poisonous snakes to actually bite the people and the, the, the biting of the poison going into the people's skin was a burning sensation. I want to read something from a, uh, a commentary. Let's see. From a brother whose name is David Guzik. David Guzik, excuse me one second. And David Guzik gives a, a little commentary about, uh, hold on, I'm making some adjustments, so I wanna make sure I'm doing this right. Let me stop sharing my screen right quick. Okay. All right, let's look at this commentary. Okay, let me share it right quick. Okay, we're gonna let it load up. Wait a minute. Nope, that's not the one I want. Hold on one second, please. Um, okay, hold on. <laughs> As you still see, I'm trying to master this. I will master it. Thank you for your patience. Okay, let's see. This is, oh, here it is right here. Yeah, okay, let me share it. Okay, now can you see this? This is, uh, this is within the Blue Letter Bible commentary part, okay? And it's talking about Numbers 21 and 6. And... Let me read it to you. It says the Lord sent fiery serpents. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And. They bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. OK, I know you can't see that on your screen because I didn't make it big enough. Right. OK. OK. Now, it goes on to say, many of the people of Israel died. Now, look at A. It says, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. How were the serpents fiery? Some think they were red color, like the color of fire. Others believe their bite caused an intense burning sensation, so they were called fiery serpents. Now, when it talks about uh, some believe uh, they were red color, like the color of fire. Well, when you go into the first chapter of Ezekiel, 
uh, when it talks about the uh, the seraphims, uh, how their color was the color of amber. Well, that's a fiery red, red look. So some people literally think that these angelic seraphim beings came in and did something to the people. But I don't follow that logic. I actually believe that God sent poisonous snakes and the people died because they got bitten by poisonous snakes. And I'm sure if you go look up videos, people getting bit, they tell you how it's a burning sensation. They tell you how they go. It goes uh, when they get bit. Uh, that part of their body starts to go numb, so on and so forth. OK, so. I just wanted to show you that, that this is my train of thought that God actually sent uh, literal poisonous snakes to bite the people. And it says many of the people of Israel died. OK, now I'm sure we can go into other commentaries that they will actually agree uh, with what I just said. OK, now. Now, what else I want to show you is go back to, I want to go back to um, Bible Hub. Okay, so I'm back in Bible Hub. And I'm going to just keep reading. I'm not going to try to enlarge my screen, so... Just try to follow along with me. Now, okay, so that was another time where th this was a literal snake in Numbers 21 and 6. But in Numbers 21 and 7, God actually instructed Moses to make a brazen serpent, right, and put it on a pole. Well, that brazen serpent was used to uh, heal the people of their wounds from being bitten by a snake. Now, there's something I'm going to share with you uh, from another site that I might visit from time to time. Okay. And let me stop sharing this. Hold on one second, please. Okay. All right, and I'm going to share something else. Share screen. Okay. Here we go. Okay, now I'm not sure how many of you all are familiar with this site, but this is actually HebrewForChristians.com. Hebrew for christian.com now i'm going down a little bit in this uh in this site and this is what's interesting to me okay how people can't pick up that adam is the serpent but they clearly recognize that it was another man who was actually used metaphorically as a serpent. Now watch this. I'm going to read this to you, right? Okay. Let me see. Where do I want to start? It says, the Lord, in, the Lord then instructed Moses, make for yourself a burner in reference to the burning of the serpents and place it upon a pole. OK, like a banner or a standard. And it shall be that anyone who was bitten. When he looks upon it shall live. And Moses made a bro bronze serpent and placed it on a pole. And it was that if the serpent bit someone and he would stare intently at the copper snake that he would live, Numbers 21, 8 through 9. Now, I'm going to read what the commentary is saying right here. It says, Yeshua, or that's Jesus the Christ, referred to this episode when he spoke to Nicodemus 
or Nicodemus about the way of salvation. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. John chapter three, 14 through 15. Humanity as a whole has been bitten by the snake and needs to be delivered from his venom. Now, let me stop right there for one second. If Jesus the Christ is symbolically being pointed to as a snake on a pole, wouldn't it logically make sense to think that, well, okay, well, how did humanity get, get bitten by a serpent? Notice that Jesus is a flesh and blood man. Well, who also was a flesh and blood man in the beginning? Well, everybody knows that that was Adam. So what I'm saying to you, metaphorically speaking, Adam would be considered to be called a serpent too, metaphorically, just like Jesus the Christ is called a serpent. And the poison that was issued to mankind was sin and death based off of Adam disobeying God's command in Genesis chapter two. Okay. So it goes on to say, just as the image made in the likeness of the destroying snake was lifted up for Israel's healing. So the one man made in the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans eight and three was to be lifted up as the healer of the world. Bless his holy name. Okay, so now that was Hebrews for Christian.com. Hebrews for Christian.com. And you can go, you know, check that out. And the title of that, let me make sure I give you that title. Okay, it's called Yeshua our serpent. Hebrews for Christians. Dot com Yeshua our serpent further thoughts on a uh, parashat uh Shukat <laughs> now go check that out you can read through it for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about okay now where do I want to go from here is back to um let me stop sharing my screen I want to go back to the lexicon and give me one second and i'm going to bring up the lexicon again so we can see it see what's going on all right all right so i'm back going back to the lexicon Okay, share. Okay, hopefully you can see it. I can see it on my screen. But hopefully you can see that I'm back in Brown Driver Briggs lexicon. And I'm showing you in different verses of scripture where the word serpent is actually pointing to man. Sometimes it's used as a literal serpent. Sometimes it's used as a mythological serpent. We know that the uh, the brazen serpent that Moses created for the people to look upon that was literally bitten by poisonous snakes. They lift, looked upon a, a man-made created object and God said, look upon that brazen object and you'll be healed of that poison, right? Now, we know that that wasn't a real, uh, actual, literal snake. So it was a mythological snake, right? Well, think about just what we just got through read in HebrewsForChristian.com. 
just as Jesus was pointed to symbolically as being the serpent hung on a cross. Well, in Genesis chapter three, we hear about this serpent having a conversation with the woman, Eve, right? But then there's no mention of the man, Adam, being named at the first, second, or even third verse of that chapter in Genesis 3. But when, then when you go further down into the chapter, God is coming down into the garden, calling for Adam, and the one who actually speaks up is Adam. Now, in my mind, because I already understand this, the serpent and Adam is one and the same. Now, there's a lot more breakdown that we can go into because I know a lot of people will have a lot of different, you know, questions to ask about different verses within chapter three. But the bottom line is, metaphorically, the word serpent in Genesis three is being used towards the man Adam, just like how it's being used towards Jesus the Christ. OK, that's the point I'm trying to make now. I'm back in Brown Driver Briggs, and I just want to I just want to read something to you from. Let's see. All right, I'm going to uh, let's see Isaiah. Isaiah, I believe Isaiah 27. And I'm I'm looking at Isaiah 27 and notice that Isaiah 27 is used in a mythological sense. But in Brown Driver Briggs, it says symbolic of world powers, symbolic of world powers, because it says in Isaiah 27, Isaiah 27, verse 1, the twisted serpent, and he will kill. King James Version, the crooked serpent, and he shall slay. International Version, even Leviathan, serpent, the twisted, will kill. Now, why did it why did Brown Driver Brig use Isaiah 27, 1 and say, that is pointing to world power. Well, just right off the top of the dome, I could tell you right off who that world power would be. If you go into Daniel chapter two, it talks about all the world powers that will have power over the nation of Israel, uh, starting with the Babylonian empire, of course, we know that the kingdom gets split between uh, the northern and the southern kingdom of Judah and Israel, right? Uh, the northern kingdom get taken into slavery by the Assyrian Empire. But then we had the kingdom of Judah that got taken into slavery by the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, but then Daniel 2 explains that the Babylonian Empire, the uh, Medio Persian Empire, the uh, Greek Empire, and then you have the Roman Empire, and then you get the ten toes with the iron mixed with clay. These are the world powers that is in control or have power over Israel, even up until this very moment in time, whether you know it or not. And the reason why I'm saying that is in Revelations chapter 12, it talks about the great dragon that swept away a third of the stars of God. Well, who would that be? Well, that would be Judah, Benjamin, and Levi that got swept away by the Roman Empire in 70 AD during the fall of Jerusalem. We know that the Jews got scattered. And some of them, a lot of them died, I believe over a million Jews, Josephus quoted. And then you had 
the rest of them, maybe like 90 something, I, I want to quote 90 something thousand that might have went into captivity or slavery, right? But a lot of them did run to different parts of the world. And the majority of them, the majority of them ran into Africa. Now, the dragon is literally the Roman Empire. Now, when it talks about uh, the dragon uh, chasing after the woman, but the, the wilderness protecting her, so on and so forth, after the wilderness protected her, it went after the descendants of the woman, right? That was clothed with the sun, and uh, I believe she was the moon was under her feet, okay? We all know that's uh, metaphoric language, right? Because the woman literally represents uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Now, but the thing is, is this, the dragon went after the descendants and overcame the descendants, right? Well, we know based off of history, that's exactly what happened when Rome sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. And then you also had numerous slaveries that took place uh, based off of the Sahara uh, slave trade, as well as the uh, transatlantic slave trade, okay? But all of it is still dealing with Rome. If you know anything about the agreement between the Pope of Rome and uh, the Islamic regimes, how they're trying to blend Christianity with Islam and Judaism, right? These are the most well-known religious groups in all the world, okay? Well, this is the iron mixed with clay because the Roman Empire is nothing like how it was uh, when it was at the height of his power uh, way back in Christ's time, right? Well, the Roman Empire is, is co-mingled with a lot of different groups of people, and they are in agreement with these different groups of people. So that's why it's iron mixed with clay. Now, I'm just going to give you a little bit of my understanding of this. But the bottom line is, it's the Roman Empire that still have uh, authority, if you will, over the children of Israel or over the Jews, okay? So that's why I'm saying, based off of what we just read in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, and I understand why Brown Driver Briggs says that it's talking about a world power. Now, I didn't say that. That was Brown. But I'm just putting all the pieces of the puzzle. I see my screen just, okay. All right. We're not talking about a fallen angel that got kicked out of heaven. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a, a nation of people that has control over the entire world right now. That's what we're talking about. So from Genesis to Revelation, there's nothing written about, uh, God kicking one of his angelic beings out of heaven, falling to the earth and literally possessing a snake to talk to Eve to deceive her. And then she turned around and persuade Adam somehow to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's nothing there that you can find in those scripture texts or verses that can point to a divine being being kicked out of heaven. Now, everybody that might be listening might point to different references of scriptures to try to discredit what I'm saying, and that's fine. But uh, if we get into a, a real serious uh, Bible study about it, you will come to the conclusion, just like I came to the conclusion, that when you're talking about the Hebrew word nakash or the Greek word ophius, 
It's always pointing to a man. It's always pointing to a man. I know a lot of you all might say, what about Satan? What about the devil? Well, these are these are these are other words that are being used that is attached on to mankind to help you to understand that that's how God is viewing mankind. Uh, when you say Satan, Satan means adversary. God is viewing mankind as being adversarial to him. When you're talking about devil, you're talking about mankind uh, being a slanderer or a liar or a deceiver. Everybody knows that man, uh, that's a part of his nature, right? So when you think about that and you go back into Genesis chapter three, when the serpent is actually talking to Eve, we all know that in Genesis chapter two, God said, if you eat from that tree, you're going to surely die. Then the serpent turns around and say, you're not going to surely die. Well, we know that's a lie. So the first liar was Adam. <laughs> that's who it was. He was the first liar. I know, I know. It's going to take a minute for that to sink in. But it's the truth. The first liar, the first deceiver was Adam. He is the serpent. He is the devil. And he is Satan. Okay? Now, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. Okay? But I, before I wrap this up, I want to I want to show you something else. So those were just a few uh, verses that I was looking at in Brown Driver Briggs, right? Now, you can actually go into it yourself. You don't have to believe me. You can take the time and go into it. But I want to go into Strong's a little bit and show you something in Strong's. OK. So I'm, I'm going into Strong's. And I want to read a few verses out of Strong's to show you. Signs. Right. Now. Take a look at this. In. Genesis. Let's see. Genesis 30 and 27. It please you stay with me. I have divined that the Lord, right? That's the NSA. And King James Version said, In thy eyes tarry for, I have learned by experience that the Lord. Now, this is pertaining to uh, Laban realizing that he was blessed by God through Jacob. Okay, now you have to go read that story. But when he said that he learned by experience or he had divine, that means that he discerned that he was being blessed by God through Jacob. And we know that Jacob uh, was trying to, I believe, marry uh, the one that he loved, which was Rachel. But there was another woman that Laban tricked him into marrying first which was the oldest daughter that's according to the custom in those days right but he had to work a whole nother seven years to get the the wife that he actually loved and god reversed that act by giving him information on how to get stronger and better and healthier flocks than laban and, and so but uh, Laban watching him use the word Nakash. He said, I have learned by experience. I have learned. That means that he learned by watching. Well, come on now. We all, <laughs> how many of you all learn things by watching? <laughs> I know I do. I learn a lot by watching. I learn a lot by observing things. 
Well, that would be the Hebrew word nakash. Okay, let me give you one more. Okay, because I don't want to, you know, be an hour on this. Let me give you one more. This is in Strong's. Okay. Now, Genesis chapter 44. Okay, 44. And I want to read verse 15. It says, a man as I can indeed practice divination. That's the NSA. King James Version says, not that such a man as I can certainly divine. What about the INT? Ye can indeed practice a man. Well, who is this? This is actually Joseph talking. Joseph is actually telling whoever it is that he's talking to. I'm not looking at the whole text, so you have to go read it. But he's using the, the Hebrew word, the kosh. A man as I can indeed. That word indeed means divine or nakash, serpent, right? Practice divination. What? You mean tell me Joseph practiced divination? Of course he did. Sure he did. Well, why would you say something like that? I got. I thought God didn't want us practicing divination. God don't want you divining the sun, moon, and stars. God don't want you to try to tell prophecies according to the nature elements, right? No, he wants you to get his information from him. And that's where Joseph got his information from, God. 